I am going to start us off with a quiz, if I may. Simple primary school type quiz, true or false. Number one, the manufacture of key components in your phones and laptops and so on is projected to contribute 86 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent by 2030. True or false? Number two, research has shown that technology has the potential to accelerate the rate at which we reduce carbon emissions. True or false? <laughs> the correct answer to both of those is true. Because you see, technology is a double-edged sword when it comes to the conversation around climate change and biodiversity protection. On the one hand, research by Accenture in 2021 showed that technology has the potential to help us reduce our carbon emissions, while on the other hand, a 2023 Greenpeace East Asia report revealed that the production of semiconductors, a key component in the technology supply chain, is projected to emit 86 million tons of carbon into the environment, equivalent, by 2030. That's more emissions than the entire country of Portugal in 2021. While no one can dispute that technological innovations like artificial intelligence can help humanity have a better outcome, researchers at the University of California Riverside and University of Texas Arlington revealed that training these language models that power AI tools such as ChatGPT takes up vast amounts of water, with Microsoft's training of GPT-3 taking up as much water as it takes to make 370 BMW cars or 320 Tesla vehicles if you, into that. While we can debate you know, the ethics and the morals and the values of AI, there is no debate that if used properly and with the right guardrails in place, AI can help us free up time that we can then use to focus on solving for humanity's grand challenges. However, if training the same models that help us solve for our grand challenges is harming the environment, then we clearly have a big problem on our hands. Because what's the point of solving for humanity's challenges if the planet we live on is going to become too hostile to be on anyway. The most recent IPCC report suggests that we have less than 10 years before all the climate catastrophes brought on by rising temperatures make Earth a very difficult place to live. 10 years. That's not a very long time. And I hesitate to call the catastrophes natural disasters, because as my friend Yeb Sano from the Philippines says, we can't call them natural disasters when the science has clearly shown us that they are exacerbated by man-made activities. Every month, if not week, there's something in the news, a new disaster somewhere. If it's not wildfires in Canada, it's droughts in the Horn of Africa. Just this year, Zambia was sending aid to neighboring Malawi after Cyclone Freddy barreled through that country leaving 1.5 million people displaced in Mozambique, Malawi, and Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, which is a landlocked country like Zambia. These disasters are not just happening in coastal countries, they affect all of us. Floods, fires, droughts, name it. We even have situations where emergency responders rush to fight wildfires in one part of the country, and before they are done, another part of the exact same country is engulfed in floods. What's Earth supposed to look like in 10 years? What are our countries supposed to look like in 10 years? Now, I know you're probably wondering why a technology person like me is standing here talking to you about climate change instead of being in a server room looking at some blinking lights and pulling cables that nobody can understand. But I'll tell you why. The answer is very simple. Because we all should be talking about climate change. I'll explain why in a moment, but first, I am going to ask you to do something that might not be comfortable for you. And if it gets too much, I want you to take a step back, take a deep breath, walk out of the room if you want to. Are you ready to come with me as I explain why you, and yes, you, should be talking about climate change? All right, let's go. I want you to take a moment Take a breath 
and imagine your typical Thursday afternoon going into evening. You're in your home, whether you live alone or with others, and you're watching TV maybe, listening to the pitter-patter of rain outside. There was a government warning on the weather, but these happen in your region, so you're sure it will come and it will pass and all will be fine. You finish up, sip some tea, prepare for Friday and you go to bed. At four o'clock in the morning, you are woken up by the sound of a typhoon barreling through your town. Windows go flying, roofs are flying off, buildings are collapsing. Everyone is screaming and running outside for safety. You too run outside. Once you're outside, you see your neighbor put his four daughters on the ground in a huddle, trying to cover them and protect them with his arms. He's telling the oldest daughter to hang on to the youngest one no matter what. After what seems like ages, it starts to subside. But just as that happens, waters come sweeping in from the ocean. Your neighbor now has to jump up, grab onto his daughters, the youngest one on his shoulders, because the water's now up to his chest level. In a nearby hospital, patients had been taken to the basement, IV drips and all, to protect them from the winds that had come rushing through. But now the basement is filling with water and they have to be taken back up, some on mattresses, with the hope that someone rescues them. Eventually the typhoon passes and there is devastation and chaos everywhere. There are dead bodies lying in the streets and civilians such as yourselves have to help move them. Because of the infrastructure damage, there's no guarantee that aid will come anytime soon. So you're not sure when you get clean food and clean water. All this because Earth's temperatures had been rising and the warmer weather gave the typhoon the boost that it needed to become even more deadly. Now I know I say to imagine, but for millions of Filipinos, this was no imaginary scenario when Super Typhoon Haiyan burst through their cities. This imaginary scenario was their mad reality. Thousands of lives lost. 7,500 people gone. I have lost a loved one or two, and the pain that I have felt, I wouldn't wish it on anyone. And yet we all continue to act like all these lives that we're losing to climate catastrophes should be conversations for somebody else, conversations for people in the UN, conversations for business people, for climate activists, for the EU. These are conversations that all of us should be engaged in because every life is important. Every single life, whether it's that life that's lost because of a drought and a famine somewhere, or whether it's that child's safety that's compromised because they have to migrate from southern Zambia to somewhere else in search of dwindling resources, we should all be enraged. I'm frankly very surprised when I meet people who are not angry about climate change because me, I am angry. I am very angry because I understand that while the brunt of these climate crises are borne by countries such as the Philippines and such as Zambia where I come from, we contributed far less to this crisis than the developed nations did and continue to. I want you to understand that while we are bearing these consequences, we contributed far less. But in the midst of my, hang uh, my anger, there is some hope. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful because I believe that each and every one of us that you and I will rally and each do what we need to do. That if you're a technologist like me, you will work really hard to help businesses, organizations, governments, individuals understand the potential that technology holds to help us in the fight against climate change. That businesses will understand that through the use of technology and in particular data, they can track their supply chains and make sure that they're reducing their carbon emissions to as far an extent as they possibly can. That they can use technology to innovate, to come up with better agricultural practices, to come up with better alternatives to fossil fuels, and perhaps even just use technology to connect to those indigenous communities and learn from them how they have managed to coexist with nature in a healthy way. Or perhaps you're a lawyer 
You can lend a hand by supporting those grassroots organization with legal aid when they are trying to fight for protection for their lands from destruction. You can maybe take on the big corporates for harming the environment. It doesn't matter what you do. You can be a student, a teacher, a doctor, an entrepreneur. You have a role to play. You can raise your voice and demand that all industries, including the technology industry, start to use renewable sources of energy without fail. That they all come up with sustainable, sustainability strategies that are actually real. Not just promising to plant 50,000 trees in some place in Africa. We don't have 40 years to wait for those trees to grow. We have less than 10, less than 10 years. And if you work for the government, for an international organization that has some influence, or if you're a regulator, it is your duty to make sure that those that are harming the environment pay and that licenses are not granted to greedy corporations that are only interested in profit over people and planet. That no one is given a license to mine the deep sea, to mine the Amazon, to mine the lower Zambezi, because we understand what destruction of those ecosystems means for humanity. And if you still can't see yourself in any of this, I just ask that the next time you want to buy that latest phone, even though your current one works fine, just ask yourself whether you're contributing to the destruction by your overconsumption of technology. But in all this, and I will say this slowly because I think it's important, in all of this, developing nations must not be penalized and hindered from reaching levels of development that allow them to also provide quality basic services to their citizens. In all this, they should not be penalized, but instead enabled through climate financing and technological innovation to leapfrog those harmful practices that developed nations use to get to where they are. Because we cannot afford to do the same thing. And therefore, we need to find alternative solutions. The Paris Agreement of 2015 promised climate finance, but today, almost a decade later, follow through has been dismal despite everyone understanding that it is the key to a just transition. Everybody understanding that it is the key for marginalized communities to build their resilience and their coping mechanisms, and that it is the key to ensuring that no one gets left behind. In that fateful week of Typhoon Haiyan, AG, my colleague and friend um, Yeb Sano's brother, counted 73 bodies that he had to move with his own hands. Don't let this be anyone else's story. Insist that everyone act now. <laughs>